Okay, why don't we get started? So again, uh, welcome to this uh, installment of the NYU Law Forum, sponsored by Latham and Watkins. Our topic today, should the Supreme Court be reformed? Um, and we have a terrific panel to uh, discuss different dimensions of that question and different perspectives on it. Um, we're really grateful to everyone for uh, making themselves available for this panel. Full introductions of them would more than uh, consume all of the time that we have for this panel. So I will be brief and in alphabetical order. Uh, Bob Bauer, uh, professor of practice and distinguished scholar in residence here at NYU Law, and also the co-chair of the Presidential Commission on the Supreme Court of the United States, on which all of our panelists, uh, including myself, served. Ala T. Johnson, the professor of law at Columbia Law School. Caroline Fredrickson, a distinguished visitor from practice at Georgetown and senior fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice here at NYU Law. David Levy, a professor of law at Duke University School of Law, also the former dean there. And before that, a federal district judge. And Rick Pildes, the Sudler Family Professor of Constitutional Law here at NYU. I'm Trevor Morrison. I'm the dean at the law school. And as I say, um, it happens that all of us on this panel served on the Presidential Commission on the Supreme Court of the United States that was established by executive order by President Biden in April of last year and delivered its final report uh, in December of last year addressing issues of Supreme Court reform. Um, and issues and debates of Supreme Court reform certainly are, are not um, simply a matter of what our commission worked on and what our commission did, but it's a great opportunity today for a number of folks on the commission to give their own personal views now that we're not speaking as the commission, but just individually. I thought I might start though um, by asking Bob Bauer, if you would give us a sense of why the president established this commission and what really was its task. I think we all know that questions of whether and how to reform the Supreme Court, whether the court is in need of reform, um, have been raised with greater urgency in recent years. But why is that? Um, and what was the thinking behind establishing a commission to take up these questions? The question, of course, came up uh, during the presidential campaign. And it was a President Biden's view that it required a systematic examination. And he had in mind a couple of pillars or requirements for that examination to be useful. One, that experts be assembled. And that two, it be bipartisan across party lines, across the ideological divide. And that given that it would in fact be on this very difficult topic on which there are many disagreements, complex issues, that he wouldn't ask that his commission produce concrete recommendations, I'll return to that in a minute, but that he would want him them to provide him with a thoroughgoing account of the contemporary debates, the arguments for and against on issues like legality, good sense, prudence, policy, and that uh, in assessing uh, the reform debate and particularly particular reform proposals that the commission provide him with a critical appraisal. And I wanna underscore the term critical appraisal because if the report is read closely, it will be clear that the commission did not simply supply a dates and battles account of who said what about what to whom on Supreme Court reform. There are judgments rendered uh, within the frame of critical appraisal. And we'll talk about some of those judgments. And they touch upon question about the constitutionality of whether you call it court packing or expansion, adding justices to the court, questions of uh, transparency and process that have been associated with the court's management of its emergency docket, sometimes referred to uh, as the shadow docket, uh, questions of judicial ethics that Supreme Court, um, uh, whether or not the Supreme Court ought to have uh, adopted for itself uh, sort of within its discretion, but in some fashion that would be sort of clear and at least normatively binding an ethics code. And throughout this report, uh, the commission notes disagreement among the commissioners, but also notes directions that it believes are most productive in the conversation of court reform. And for a commission of 34, so quite diverse in outlook, the report that emerged, I, I have to say, and since I didn't, uh, I'm one of 34, so I'm not patting myself on the back. I'd like to pat the commission on its collective back. I think it did produce a critical appraisal that will uh, seriously inform the reform debate. And let me just close by saying some of the debate that we've seen recently, uh, including, for example, and I'm sure the subject is going to come up, 
uh, an article by Professor Siegel at uh, Duke Law on the subject of court packing, engages directly with the uh, report. Uh, he has um, questions about whether the report adequately assessed the constitutionality of court packing or expansion. And throughout, the, throughout his analysis, he's continually repairing to what the commission had to say on that subject. And that is precisely the outcome, a you know, critical appraisal that informs the debate that President Biden hoped to achieve with this report. Great. Um, Alati Johnson, I might ask you to chime in here too. Um, how do you think about the contribution of the report, given that, um, as Bob just noted, it, it didn't make any formal recommendations? We, um, as members of the commission, um, heard complaints um, from the press and elsewhere, you know, as draft materials were made publicly available and it became clear what the commission was not likely to do. Um, but if it's even if it's a critical appraisal without recommendations, can it really make a, an important contribution to this set of issues? What do you think about that? Yeah. So just um just backing up a second, when we think about you know how to situate the report, and we can think about it as something that the that Biden um, put together the commission. But I think going back before that, you really see a real involvement of civil society groups and even framing the issues. I mean, I think right now we're at a moment in which there is unprecedented attention to the Supreme Court, not just in terms of its decisional output, but asking really fundamental uh, questions about the court, about the structure, about whether or not it should review certain issues, obviously about the, the size, the length of term. And so many of those groups were disappointed, to be sure. I think hours after um, the report was issued, I got in my inbox something from a group saying, here's our set of recommendations, and they fit on four pages, not 300 pages, right? And so I think that's a lot of the discourse. Um, but that said, um, um, one, I, I just think there, there's, there's a lot of value in the report. So one is around the process. Um, and so sometimes we romanticize a kind of deliberation, but I think there was deliberation it was public, and you see its output in the report itself. But there's also evidence of it in all the materials that are assembled, which I think are a great archive for people who think about the court, study the court, but also who want to take action. I think a second thing is really to think about it as being good on design. Um, so Bob just talked about really mapping out what is legal and what is not legal what's constitutional, what should be done by statute. We can make recommendations about things like term limits, but how do you actually design that? And I think it really provides um, a blueprint that reformers could take up if, if they wanted to. And then lastly, I just say, since we're gonna talk about this more, there are some specific recommendations that reformers could take up. Some are harder politically than others, but um, others specifically those concerning transparency and ethics reforms are things or things that could easily be done by the court itself and even by members of Congress, there could be bipartisan support for it. Great, thanks. So as has been suggested that the report does move across um, really the range of principal arguments for Supreme Court reform or principal ideas and, and evaluates them critically, appraises them critically in the way Bob described, just for our audience to remind them those issues are issues of court expansion or what is sometimes called court packing, that is whether to um, add seats to the Supreme Court. Um, questions of term limits, whether to uh, limit the amount of time that any given member of the court can uh, remain a Supreme Court justice rather than the life tenure that they have now, whether to impose limits and if so, how. Uh, questions of jurisdiction uh, alteration, even jurisdiction stripping, that is whether to change in some way the power that the court wields, in particular with respect to exercise of the power of judicial review, that is, that, that is to inspect um, legislative enactments and executive actions for their constitutionality, whether to set a higher bar in terms of a supermajority requirement, for example, in order for the court to strike down a statute as unconstitutional or otherwise to adjust the court's jurisdiction. Um, and then finally, a uh, kind of somewhat more miscellaneous category, but you might think of uh, reforms dealing with the court's internal operations, as Bob referred to. This includes matters of its how the court handles uh, items on its emergency docket, sometimes called its shadow docket, but also questions of judicial ethics, transparency and other forms, et cetera. And 
the report, which is good reading, really is um, recommended to all of you, uh, covers each of these and our discussion can cover these um, as well over the course of the next hour we have until um, two o'clock. And so we'll move through, through these categories and we'll also reserve some time after having discussed each um, to talk a little bit about the confirmation process with Justice Breyer's announcement of his intention to retire from the court. Of course, all eyes now are on President Biden and thinking about whom he might nominate, but once he's made a nomination, the next step will be the confirmation process in front of the Senate. Um, and a lot of the discussion around Supreme Court reform is sort of inextricably linked to questions of the confirmation process and whether it needs reforming. That wasn't part of our mandate, um, but there's material in the report including its in appendices addressing this. And so we thought we could take that up some here too. Um, but why don't we start with the question of court expansion? Caroline Fredrickson, thanks for joining us. I know you had to run straight from class to get here. Um, thank you. Um, could you tell us a little bit, just, just sort of lay the basics of that issue out? And maybe if you could provide in summary for us your views on, on the issue. Do you think this is uh, a reform um, worth considering seriously? Um, what do you think? Sure, thank you, um, Trevor, and thanks everybody um, for um, letting me be with you today. It was such a great experience being on the commission. It's so nice to see you all again so soon after. Um, and uh, and I do apologize, not only did I run from class, but I have to run back to class uh, that starts at 1.55. So, and I may be eating my lunch as this program goes on too. So, um, so I apologize for that. But um, um, so the court expansion issue, um, and I will note that I say court expansion because you might it, you might get some value um, some v value judgment out of that, but um, uh, uh, was really one of the more contested issues um, in front of the commission, um, in in and and for a number of reasons. I mean, these were again they were more uh, discussions that um, uh, Due to a particular ideological or partisan alignment, um, they were really um, cut across um, um, from a range of um, perspectives. One is sort of the efficacy. Um, does it really, well, first of all, is there a problem? I mean, then does, is this a reform that actually solves that problem or does it cause more problems than it might actually uh, seek to resolve? Um, and so I'd say, you know, the sort of just you know, obviously the sort of the first point is that, um, you know, the, the the Congress controls the, the ability to set the size of the of the court, and it has changed the size of the Supreme Court over our history uh, numerous times. Um, and so there's a recognition that this, you know, of all of the reforms that might be possible, this is one we, you know, although there was a, a counterpoint of view from one of the uh, from one of the um, uh, witnesses um, of whether it would be unconstitutional based on the intentions behind the court expansion, um, which maybe we can talk about, but. Overall, there's generally Congress has done it. They've done it many times. Um, the court's been smaller. Um, it's never been bigger, um, but it has been smaller. Um, and um, uh, and I think even many people who would analyze the intentions would say maybe it was even done for partisan reasons, um, shrinking the court in the past after the uh, after President Lincoln died and President Johnson um, uh, that the uh, the Republicans wanted to deny him the ability to appoint um, to the vacant. Supreme Court seats, so they shrank it. Um, you know, so we we spent a lot of time uh, talking about um, um, sort of you know first of all, like, uh, you know whether there's a problem, um, and if so, whether this would resolve it. So I think those are the two major questions. So is there a problem with the court? And there was a lot of, you know, I think you know as as Alati had mentioned, you know there was a lot of backdrop to this, um, and and Bob as well as sort of what what was the sort of the impetus for having this conversation was that there. Uh, uh, that there was a lot of um, dismay over the process of uh, by which uh, Merrick Garland was not um, given a hearing um, and there was not a vote in the uh, in the Senate under President Obama and then uh, how the subsequent nominations were moved forward uh, um, through you know with, with Gorsuch the end of the filibuster for Supreme Court nominees um, with Kavanaugh with all of the um, well, Sturm und Drang that that um, entailed. And then of course with Amy Coney Barrett um, with um, many feeling very aggrieved about the lateness of the process um, 
by which she was confirmed. So there's a lot of this backdrop um, of stolen seats, of, of in, uh, inappropriate uh, of procedure, uh, of bending the rules uh, in favor of one partisan and ideological alignment. And that we now ended up with a court that is severely out of step with where um, uh, the sort of the mainstream of America is. Um, and um, um, now you could say that and say that the response should not be necessarily to try and uh, uh, address it through um, expansion of the court. Um, uh, however, um, I think, you know, the, the coupled with the idea of term limits, um, uh, one can start thinking, of the, the, we can talk, I'm sure we'll talk about term limits, but in a, in a situation where Supreme Court justices are not limited and live um, really long lives and serve for a really long time, um, it starts to become a very existential problem to have a court so out of alignment with, uh, with, the, with mainstream, I'm not saying the public, exclusively mainstream constitutional thought. Um, and, um, and therefore, what do we do about that if we see projecting many decades into the future that that's gonna have an iron grip um, on the American political system? And, and the most obvious now, of course, is reproductive rights, but the whole political system, gerrymandering, voting rights, um, section two of the Voting Rights Act just took a, a potentially heavy blow. Um, so, um, I'd say after all this discussion, I was more um, agnostic to it when we started. Um, but after uh, all of the discussion and consideration and, and reading the very reasoned um, contributions of my fellow commissioners, I am actually now a supporter of, of uh, court expansion. Thank you. Um, your, your comments reveal something that's important here, which is as we talk about particular ideas for reforming the court and arguments for and against, I think it's important for our audience today and for us to sort of help articulate, um, you can't really evaluate any of these arguments without understanding, well, what would, what's the reform supposed to do? What's the underlying value or, or purpose that we're driving at? And we all on the commission um, confronted many times arguments uh, making reference to values of um, the legitimacy of the court, the independence of the court, uh, arguments with respect to democracy and the court's relationship to democracy. Of course, the problem and the introductory chapter of the report uh, points this out is that none of those terms is self-defining. And you can imagine arguments for and against a particular reform that say that you know, legitimacy will be enhanced or independence will be enhanced by adopting this reform and legitimacy will be enhanced um, and independence will be enhanced by not adopting the reform. But nevertheless, we should, I think, attend to those underlying reasons as well as, of course, the question of whether any particular reform would be lawful. David Levy, as Caroline says, the history of the, of the country and the court is one where the size of the Supreme Court has been adjusted by Congress over time through the 19th century, as, as few as five justices at some points, um, as many as 10. Uh, and so one might think, well, as to the legality question anyway, this is within Congress's power, although there, uh, we were exposed to some counter arguments. I wonder what you think about that, but then if it is legal, um, is it a good idea in your view? Would it enhance legitimacy, yeah. independence, democracy or not? What do you think? Well, thank you. Uh, it hasn't been adjusted uh, recently. Let, let's just say it's been about 150 years, I think, since Congress has thought uh, that, it, that it should change the size of the court. And we can, we can debate, and scholars do debate, whether uh, when Franklin Roosevelt uh, asked the Congress to change the size of the court, uh, whether sort of what, what the temper of the times was. But I, I think it's, it's fair to say that, number one, it didn't happen. And number two, at least for a long time, we have felt that it was very ill-advised of Roosevelt. And I, I think he would have, I think he would agree, agree with that. It, uh, it, uh, it didn't turn out well for him. And it, it was viewed as, as, um, as a very powerful norm uh, that we have. I, I think you're exactly right, Trevor, in saying that it's very hard to think about any of these reforms without, try, without thinking fairly deeply about what your concept of law is and what you think the job of the Supreme Court is. So I'll, I'll tell you, <laughs> I'll give you what I think. Um, 
and I'll, I'll admit, it's based on the fact that for 17 years, I was a U.S. district judge. So this is very, this is very much a view, uh, I would say, from underneath the court. Um, I want the Supreme Court to be a court. I want it. I want the justices to act like judges. I want them to be independent, and I want them to be nonpartisan, and I want them to appear uh, nonpartisan. I don't want them in voting blocks uh, that are stable. I don't want them ideological. I want them to approach cases with an open mind. I want them to be persuadable. I want them, in short, to be judges. And I don't like uh, Supreme Court exceptionalism either. I think uh, there are times when we should view the court as exceptional because it is the court of last resort. And we can talk about that a little bit. For example, recusal is different at the level of the Supreme Court than it is for a lower court. But on the whole, I think um, my approach is to say they are Article Three judges, just like district judges and circuit judges. And all of them, almost without exception, were judges and they were picked, um, presumably because they were judges and we should view them in that light. And what we should be doing is to try to um, preserve the Supreme Court as a court. And that is the way it, I believe that it attains its, its legitimacy. I, I'll add one other thing. I think the court should be very respectful of its own precedent. And I think it should, uh, it should be extraordinary when it deviates because when it throws its precedent um, sort of on the table as something that it can change at any time, it creates a lot of this pressure around the confirmation process because everything seems to be up for grabs and the court seems to be kind of a continuous constitutional convention. So those are kind of my, my basics. And I don't see court expansion as uh, being consistent with those, with those desires. I, I think um, court, what court expansion does is it treats the court as a political body and it says there, we want to put uh, justices in place who are going to do certain things that we agree with. Uh, I don't know that whether the court is in step or out of step with the American people. I'm not discerning enough to know that. They, they, the court may be out of step with constitutional scholars around the country. That, that may be true, but um, I don't know that the court, I, I, I just couldn't, I can't make a judgment on that. Uh, the, the, I'm told and we read that the, that the country is very divided. So, uh, and maybe evenly divided. So maybe the court is also almost evenly divided. I'm not sure. But uh, how will this work? So we, we add three judges, uh, justices, we add five, um, and they're supposed to, uh, to counter the judges, the justices who were just appointed. And then uh, when the next party gets in office, they add another five or they add 10. Um, you know, it's just going to be um, a constant round of adding justices, uh, and it will be a, uh, a concession that the court is a political body. It's a sort of like a quasi Senate. Um, and so we assign people to the, we, we put people on the court and, and they have a job. I mean, they're, they're not just going on the court to be a judge. They're going on the court to effectuate a certain agenda. That you know, that's a, that's a system. Uh, I just don't happen to support it. But I mean, you could say, look, why not have an elite group of people who have extraordinary power, and they will be elected or selected for political reasons. And there'll be like a council of revision or something of that sort that I think the framers rejected, but they could, you know, we could, we can set up our system that way if we wanted to but it won't be a court any longer. It'll be something else. Um, and so I, I am opposed to it. And I, I think at the end of the day, Americans would be very shocked. They, they will lose um, this revered institution um, that we've had. So I, I think we should be extremely careful before we go down that road and we should try everything else. Um, in the meantime, to try to, uh, I, I would say, reverse this sense of the court as a political body. Thank you. Um, I'm happy for anyone else to jump in here. Our panel is small enough to just unmute yourself and have at it. But one, one thing that occurred to me, David, just in response to what you were saying, um, 
so there are there are threats to the court being a court that could come from outside the court. <clears throat> and then there are things that the court itself could do that could alter our perception of whether it's continuing to operate um, as a court in the way that you just described um, the, the ideal that, that you and I think many would prefer, um, which prompts for me this kind of question, you know, what if at least on the sort of most hotly contested issues, what if there, there do turn out to be relatively stable voting blocks, as I think many would say there have been for most years in the last 30 years, at least on the Supreme Court, not perfectly stable and certainly not in every case and um, not recognized by the public, I think, is the large fraction of cases at the court that are decided either unanimously or nearly unanimously. But among those hotly contested five, four kind of cases, um, or even if not, say six, three, the sort of who's going to be in the six and who the three, who the five and who the four is often quite predictable. And then just to point to one other thing that you, you mentioned, what if the court at any particular point in its history, including maybe now, um, evinced less inclination to follow its precedents um, than in the past? That is, is there some point, even hypothetically, where the court by its own actions um, would kind of precipitate legitimately some kind of response, perhaps even including um, court expansion, where the court didn't take those actions and continue to behave as the kind of court that you were saying you prefer, um, then it would be appropriate for say Congress to stay its hand and not to, not to add seats. Do you think of it in those terms or, or not? Well, I don't think we're there yet, but I, I, I would, cons I mean, con I, I think Congress does have that power. And so if, if Congress made the judgment that look, the, the, the court has already become a political body and we're really in a fix here, uh, then I suppose Congress could, could do what it thought had to be done. But the price, I think, would be extremely high. And as you say, it's, um, you know, it's, it's fairly recent that, that we find ourselves in a situation where you know, we don't have uh, the filibuster any longer, and we don't have presidents, apparently, committed to appointing people who have support from the other side. We don't have senators who are eager to see that really great people are nominated and then confirmed. Um, we do have interest groups that are anxious to uh, see the confirmation process as an opportunity to raise money and to further uh, the rifts in American society and then benefit from them. I mean, we're, you know, we're in something of a fix. I, 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 I'm, not, I'm not blind to this, but I, I, I don't think that the way to the, the fix the fix we're in is through court packing. I think that's just surrender. And uh, I don't want to see that happen. As you say, certainly one thing to contend with if, for those who are um, favorably disposed to court packing is, is the sort of tit for tat problem um, and how one stops that process if it begins. Um, and the, the report certainly uh, acknowledges that. Um, maybe just making sure that we move along so we can touch all issues. Um, let's talk about term limits. Um, and Rick, I might turn to you. Um, the, this, one of the major contributions of the report on this is to work through in a really thoughtful way the sort of mechanical issues that arise. If one wanted to pursue term limits, how could it be done as a legal matter? And then practically speaking, um, in order to work, how would it need to be set up? And I think it would be helpful if we covered some of that, but maybe to begin with, why would one perhaps be in favor of term limits? What is it supposed to achieve other than causing justices not to serve for life? But what's the underlying value there that we'd be thinking about as we think about whether to favor term limits? Thanks, Trevor. So yeah, starting at that sort of broad level, um, I, I think it's helpful for uh, students and others uh, to recognize that life tenure for judges is unique to the federal courts in the United States. Um, there is no other major democracy that for its constitutional court or high court um, has life tenure. Uh, every other system uses either a mandatory retirement age or a fixed term of office. Um, in our state judiciaries, only Rhode Island 
has life tenure. State courts are very different from federal courts in a variety of ways, but, but nonetheless, some state court systems were set up with life tenure originally, and over time, uh, because state constitutions are much easier to amend than the federal constitution, the movement has been entirely in one direction, moving away from life tenure to uh, uh, fixed terms or mandatory retirement uh, ages. Um, and you know, I think it's my own view that if we were creating the federal court system or at least the Supreme Court today, we would be unlikely to create life tenure. Many of these other systems borrowed the idea of judicial review from the United States and a written constitution, um, borrowed some other features of our system, but they all rejected life tenure for federal judges. Um, so I think it's important to put that kind of general uh, perspective on the, on the question. Then more specifically, uh, with the way things have developed over time in the US, uh, we have learned about some of the strange features uh, that I think are somewhat hard to defend that go along with life tenure. Uh, and again, I'm going to focus on the Supreme Court here. Um, but because of life tenure, the, the moment at which justices leave the court um, can be highly random. Uh, they leave because they choose to retire or public health reasons require it. Um, and that means that although the system was set up, to have a political process in choosing judges and confirming them. You know, the president nominates, the Senate confirms. The, the linkage between appointments to the court and that process has becomes very random. So some presidents in one term of office get three appointments to the Supreme Court. Some presidents in one term of office get no appointments to the Supreme Court. Uh, and it's very hard for me to understand, especially given how consequential an institution the court has become, how significant uh, appointments of justices are. Uh, it's hard for me to understand what the rationale would be if we were actually trying to design this today to set up a system in which it's completely random, uh, whether a particular president gets zero, one, two, three uh, appointments. Um, it's also the case as, um, I think Carolyn mentioned this, uh, but we all know that uh, the court has changed as an institution over time in the sense that justices serve far longer than they used to. Uh, so uh, before 1970, on average, justices served 15 years on the court. Since 1970 or so, when justices retire, they have served an average of 26 years. It's a very significant difference. Justice Breyer, in retiring, I think he's in his 27th year, some close to that. Justice Thomas has been on the court for 30 years at this point, um, as an example. Um, and we know because these appointments are so consequential, presidents have been looking for younger justices to appoint so they can be more assured their justice will serve for as long as possible. Uh, and also the way the system is currently set up, it's bad for the court in the sense that uh, Decisions about whether to retire, when to retire, um, come to be seen in politically strategic terms, whether that's why justices are making these decisions or not. You know, are justices calculating when they're going to leave the bench so that a same party president can appoint their successor? We now see tremendous pressure brought to bear on justices to retire uh, so that a particular president of a particular party can, can appoint their successor. I don't think that's good for the court. Uh, and so I had not really thought hard about this issue of term limits for the justices before serving on the commission. But through serving on the commission, I did come to the view that, that this would be uh, better for the court, better for the country. Um, although the transition to how you get there is, is complicated, um, I agree. Um, and the proposal that we talk about in the report that is the most common version of term limits is a proposal for 18 year terms of service on the court. Uh, as I say, that's longer than justices used to serve on average uh, through our history until 1970 or so. Um, and the advantage of structuring it with 18 year terms is that every president would get two nominations in a, in a four year term. You would regularize the process of filling seats on the court. It would be staggered 18 year terms. Every staggered 18 year terms. 
Um, one view is that uh, in the first and third years of a new administration, the president would have one appointment to fill, and eventually everyone would, would serve on the court for 18 years. If someone had to leave early, the president would just get to fill out the remainder of that 18-year term. So there's no strategic, whether justices do or don't retire for strategic reasons, the perception that they might be or might be refusing to retire for strategic reasons, I think is not good for the court. Uh, and so 18-year uh, terms would basically, I think, eliminate the issues about strategic retirements or perceptions of strategic retirements. I am very strongly uh, a believer of the, in the importance of judicial independence, as, as David Levy mentioned. Uh, and if I thought term limits, 18-year terms would compromise judicial independence, I would be against them. Um, but uh, if you look at these very strong constitutional courts that exist in a number of other countries like Germany, Canada, that have mandatory retirement or term limits, um, I don't think you see uh, that judicial independence is compromised if the term of service is long enough. Uh, and I think 18 years is, is long enough to ensure that we would still have uh, the kind of judicial independence that I think we, we all want. So I don't know if I should stop there and not get too much into the nitty gritty details, but just as a general matter, that's kind of an, an overview of my perspective uh, as to why 18 year terms would be a good idea for the, for the country to consider. Great, thanks. Yeah, let's, let's have others weigh in on this question of the, of the underlying values um, for why one might want to do this and, and what could be lost if one did do it. And then we should, because because it's an important, and I think broadly speaking, probably underappreciated follow on set of questions. If one wanted to pursue it, how could you do it? Um, and what else might have to follow? But just, so, um, just to supplement something that um, Rick said, and then I'll turn to, to Bob and I, um, David, I know you've thought a lot about this particular issue and wanna give you an opportunity to make the case against. <laughs> um, just supplementing one thing that Rick said, um, I think there are two views about when vacancies happen now, and probably, perhaps anyway, they both happen. Um, one is a kind of randomness. If, if justices serve until, until death, for example, then it's the, it's the unpredictability of that that determines when a vacancy arises. Um, and so you could have three in one four-year presidential term and none in another. As Rick says, President Trump had three, President Carter had zero. Um, the other is strategic, which is not random, um, that uh, justices are waiting for a presidential administration that is congenial to them politically or waiting for some other constellation like that, and then picking. Those are two different kinds of problems, but to proponents of, of um, term limits, if done on an 18 year term, staggered two year terms, I think the argument in favor is that you would solve both. Um, you would remove the randomness and you would remove the incentive to game or the appearance that gaming has been achieved. And just important, I think, to see that those are two different problems, um, but maybe both um, at least ameliorated by term limits. Bob, what do you think? My own view, and I expected long before I got on the commission, was that term limits was absolutely reform uh, worthy of consideration. I think the report advances that debate uh, by both airing very thoughtfully both perspectives, Rick's and those in his camp and David and those in his camp, I fall um, much more in Rick's camp, and I think that the report uh, further advances the debate by uh, engaging with some of the technical questions, some of the transitional and other technical details of how you would do it, and I think a very effective way. But the one comment I want to make uh, goes to um, how we were addressing the pitfalls of court expansion slash packing. And David Lee very eloquently made the case against it and said, we want to preserve the court as a court. Uh, and we were not going to do that if we don't continue to buffer it against the political process. So if we turn it into a political body, we're just accelerating the very trend that, you know, at least everybody purports to lament, most purport to lament it. You don't see a lot of constitutional scholars on either side cheering the idea of turning the Supreme Court into an auxiliary of one of the two political parties. I mean, that's just not viewed as a really appropriate way to view the role of the court. If we are concerned uh, about the position that the court has been in uh, and whether, whatever view one takes about whether the court brought some of these problems on itself by its own conduct or whether it's just caught up in the sort of swirl of a polarized politics, 
one way to preserve the court as a court and as an alternative to this debate on expansion slash packing is to institute term limits. I mean, I view that as a measure of preserving the court as a court. I actually think it actually answers uh, some of the concerns that David Levy rightly lists as the concerns that we should have in assessing any reform of the court, which is to preserve in, in that court the institutional values that we think are most critical and to distinguish it as a court uh, from other institutions. And I think uh, term limits um, is a, a far preferable way of doing that, frankly. I think it is far preferable to expansion. I think it avoids the tit for tat problem. It's not like any other reform without complications, and the report doesn't blink them and tries to engage with them. And then one other point that I want to make um, about one objection that we've heard, which is, my gosh, it'll take so long. You know, if it's done, particularly by constitutional amendment, it will take forever. There are significant issues that report reviews, significant issues associated with attempting to accomplish anything like this by statute. So if you assume constitutional amendment is the route, that that's both the right answer and probably just as a question of how this sort of reform ought to be affected, the most prudential uh, way of approaching it, the, the one that's most prudent in approaching it, the one that will draw the most uh, acceptance, uh, some might say, and some have said, well, that's not going to solve the immediate problem. And I want to register my view, we can't think of reform this way. We're not reforming institutions on a moment's notice for the immediate generation to address its problems. We're looking at our institutions and hopefully taking the long view and saying, uh, what are the adjustments that probably need to make that are going to be critical for the generations that follow us? Uh, granting that we have only so much foresight and wisdom, but at the same time, the best that we can. And I think it's a huge mistake to let reform of these institutions fall victim to the question of whether they're worth it if they can't be implemented tomorrow to address a concern that we can express just today. I think that's the wrong way to look at institutional reform, which is why I hope that this term limit debates moves forward uh, and does not fall victim to that particular objection. Thanks for that. And that certainly, I think, resonates with a hope that I hope all of us on the commission have, which is that the report that we produced is not something whose you know, half-life is just a news cycle or two, but can help inform a debate that surely will, will last for a very long time. I think this, this issue, um, just in the work of the commission, um, took on sufficient centrality, that is the question of term limits, that it may be worth um, making sure that, that everyone on the panel has an opportunity to speak to it. So um, David, your camp has been invoked by Bob, so let me turn to you, but, um, but, but Aliti and, and Caroline, I'll welcome your thoughts as well after, after David, please. So uh, I, am, I, I, I don't like to think of it as a, in a different camp because uh, I, admire Bob and, and, and Rick uh, so much. And I really enjoyed working with Rick on this. I was uh, uh, like, like Caroline, I, I came to this thinking probably I would be in favor of term limits, but uh, as time went on, I, uh, I came to the, to the view that I was not, at least not in our present circumstances. I think it will make worse some things that we already think are bad, but I, um, I, I see the point, and it's it's obviously not a it's not a uh, frivolous proposal by any means. And I think the work that Rick did um, in sh just showing how to do this concretely, I th I thought was extraordinary and really advanced our understanding of of how term limits would work. And just to throw a a, a bit of a curveball in here and to show you how nuanced I can be and not just a curmudgeon. Uh, I favor age limits, uh, so I, I would be in favor of having an, an age limit of, let's say, 75 or 80, 78, something of that sort. I think that makes sense. Um, and again, because I don't like Supreme Court exceptionalism, I'll go one step further. I think for the entire Article Three judiciary, I would say uh, we should have a, a reasonable age limit. I, I think that that does make sense. Uh, but I'll tell you why. I, uh, I, I can't sign on to term limits. Uh, I mean, first of all, my starting point is we, got, we have two things in Article 3 that are designed to preserve judicial independence, just, just two. <laughs> One of them is life tenure, and the other is that you can't lower the salary of, of uh, Article 3 judges during, uh, during their, their time in office. And, and so we want to approach this, I think, you know, very, very carefully. Um, so under either the 12 or 18 year proposal, uh, the president is going to have 
a lot of appointments. Under, under the 12 year, which I, I recognize is not where our focus was, although you'll see this in the, in the public debate on this, you'll, you'll see a lot of people say it should be eight years, it should be 12 years. But what follows from, uh, for, for 18 years, a, a, pre, a two-term president gets four Supreme Court appointments. That, 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 is, that is a lot. And for a 12-year term, the president would actually get six appointments. And so the majority of the court before the president um, has finished his or her second term uh, will have appointed a majority of the justices. Now, you know, for much of human history, certainly for much of uh, Western history, uh, Western democratic history, the control of the uh, of executive power, with the monarchical uh, power, has has been the you know the the main thrust of uh, sort of achieving democracy. And and you know we're not we're not done with that worry. <laughs> so we're we're looking to the future, as Bob said, and the future is long. We hope, and the the risks of a autocratic uh, president are not negligible. I think uh, we all see that. And do we want to give the president that degree of authority as on a regular basis uh, over the court? So I think, I think that's a question. And how would this actually, how would this work, play out? Well, so when we're, it will, it will knit court appointments to the presidential election cycle. I, I think this is the, the major point that I'd like to make a president when when we have a president presidential election the president is going to say to the american people as president trump did um i will certainly have two appointments and uh i will have a trump list i, I think they will go further than that i think they will say here are my two appointments and those two appointments will become part of the presidential election cycle and I, they will in effect become elected justices. I wouldn't be surprised if uh, down the road, a president invites those uh, potential nominees to campaign with the president. And I think the days in which people will say, oh gee, you shouldn't ask a justice, a potential justice, uh, how they're gonna rule on certain things. I think those days will be over. The, the only question will be how much can a justice say before a recusal motion would might be filed, but every people, everybody will know where the justice stands. It will be very similar to what we see in some of the state court elections, which uh, you know are really unfortunate from from my point of view. And then to make matters worse, once we've gone through this election cycle and the two people have been, uh, let us just say, uh, supported by the American people through the election, now they're going to go through this awful confirmation process, which is just gonna be, you know, which has turned into a circus. I think we have to admit to this. It's been very destructive of the court um, and very unfortunate. And so now uh, it's like, we're gonna be in a perpetual election cycle and these folks will be back and forth in front of the, the Senate. And we're gonna have more of this because with uh, and by design we're going to have more turnover so we're going to have more confirmation hearings and uh, as adam white a fellow commissioner said to me this reminds me of the joke about um, a, a restaurant review where the the complaint was that the food was inedible and the portions were too small so what if if we don't like <laughs> the confirmation process and i don't think any of us do why do we want more of them? You know, I, I could imagine there could be a day if we can fix the confirmation process, then maybe, you know, I'll have, I would have to kind of reconsider my views. But right now, I don't think that's where we want to go. Now, the, the turnover also presents, I think, some issues for me in terms of the stability of the court, uh, the stability of doctrine, which I mentioned before. I think, uh, you know, it's, it's important that the court be predictable and stable, uh, have a high, high degree of respect for precedent under this system with presidents um, getting two appointments and when it be, it, it, and if I'm right, when it becomes part of the election cycle, then I think we're gonna see justices who come onto the court on a mission and that mission will be uh, to change you know, certain 
certain uh, cases that have already been decided. So I think we could we could be in a in a fairly unstable situation. There'll also be some gaming around the knowledge that that certain justices are coming going off and certain justices are coming on. And I'm not smart enough to figure out how all that will work out. But I think it'll be you know there'll be a cottage industry really in in strategizing around the ebb and flow of Supreme Court appointments and when to bring a case and how to bring it. Um, so I think that'll that'll be a problem. And I'll just just a couple more things. You know, we've had amazing justices who've served for very long periods of time, and I think it's actually served the court well. Uh, Justice Story was 32, I think, when he went on the court. He was younger than any of the people we're seeing appointed now. We we survived Justice Story just fine. Uh, Justice Holmes and others, the the, the great Chief Justice Marshall, uh, served for a very long time. Uh, Justice Brennan, uh, for whom uh, you know the the Brennan Center is named, uh, he he served for well over 30 years, I think, and. Uh, th th these these justices added a lot to the stability and uh, of the court and 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 respect for the court, and they made it a court again a court as a entity. I I I I feel that with coming and going uh, so often of uh, w where justices will serve for so little time with one another, it, there's a danger that the court will never gel as an institution. It won't have its own culture. It won't be truly a third branch. It'll just be kind of a collection of individual judges. So, you know, for that reason, for those reasons, I'm very wary of the proposal and I, I, I feel I can't support it. But I do think, um, although it doesn't do everything that Rick wants to achieve, um, and it presents some difficulties for me, um, in, in terms of the things that I'm worried about, I do think that age limits are appropriate um, for the entire uh, federal judiciary, I, I, as long as we we set it at a at a reasonable time. Um, I'm I come at that just because having been a chief judge, I know that um, that over time um, judges do age, and it's uh, it is it is good. Just as in many other institutions, there are age limits. Um, and those of you who, who have life tenure um, may disagree with that point, but I, I think even in the university context, you know, some sense that um, there's a time to retire, that that's, that's important. And it's particularly important for judges because they have such an impact on other people's lives. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, I'm. I certainly agree that there's a time to stop being dean. Uh, Alati, I. I was gonna, <laughs> it I was gonna, is. I, was gonna come to you, I agree I'm, with that. <laughs> yeah, I'm. I'm mindful that uh, Caroline actually, I think, has to leave to. Oh yeah. So why don't we? Yeah, sorry, Alati. Why don't we let Caroline go first, and then and then Alati, you, you'll be next. Yeah, and I'll try and be relatively brief. Um, I mean, I guess I feel like we're beyond the point. The the, the nomination process is already political theater. It's already. Um, it's, I think having what happened under President Trump when he marching around with his list donated, given to him by the Federalist Society um, of the people he would nominate. I mean, I think we've gone past that um, point where we could say that somehow the, we have a revered institution in the Supreme Court that can be outside of the presidential political situation. Uh, so I actually think that having a regularized process um, of appointments and term limits. I would actually say, perhaps, David, your arguments make me think that the term limit should be shorter um, so that the actual service would be less, uh, would be less impactful um, in that sense. Maybe make it 10 years um, and rather than 18. And as a result, it would really bring the kind of, I think the passions down around the debates over how um, important. Right now, what we see is, is um, the, the importance of when somebody is going to be appointed in their 40s um, and serve potentially into their 80s, um, that one person is of such extraordinary importance to the future of our country that it does engage everybody. Whereas if everybody, every president gets two and they last for, okay, so now I've, I've moderated the proposal to be 10 years, it all starts to become a very much less intense um, battle because justices are no longer the kings of America. 
they actually are more appropriately judges um, in a constitutional system where they don't have unlimited power. Um, so I, I agree, I think that there are a lot of complexities about the implementation process. Um, but I do think, um, as Rick has mentioned, that the examples that we have from so many other countries and from the states uh, in the United States um, give us a good hope that the system is actually works uh, much better than what we have now. And you can have a constitutional court um, that is highly respected. Its decisions are not seen as partisan. Um, and um, you don't have massive debates about um, kind of separation of powers issues and whether our, our system of government is under threat because things have gotten so out of balance. So, um, so thanks for having me. I do apologize. I have to leave in about five minutes so you'll see me disappear, but I have really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you, Caroline, for making time for, for us. Uh, Polity, what do you think on this topic? Well, I think it's really interesting that we've gotten so spicy around the uh, conversation about um, term limits, but I also think it's interesting that we're probably not as far apart as we think, and it's important to note that we're, I think, all animated by the same set of values. I mean, I think it's been very difficult to talk about judicial independence recently without people kind of snickering. Um, I know that I see this when I teach students, um, but some of many of us have an ideal of judicial independence, and I will never forget that moment in the in the commission deliberate when Sherilyn Eiffel said, you know, I work at the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. I worked there too. And um, what, you know, all the gains that LDF achieved were because of this idea of judicial independence. I always think about those judges of the Fifth Circuit who risked their lives um, to order school desegregation. I clerked for Justice John Paul Stevens. And I saw his evolution um, and his, his independence of mind, which I think was always there, but certainly enabled by that. But I think it is kind of a straw person in this debate because I think we all want that. And the question is um, whether we really, how much we really have that system in the way that we think that we do. Um, and the extent to which um, recent confirmation battles have affected that, um, and whether they've actually affected the court's independence, the fact that they affect the legitimacy. I think there is a concern that you could have more theater around confirmation. And I, you know, I think, uh, you know, David raised a lot of reasonable concerns that people have to think about, but I, I, um, you know, I think 18 years is still quite long um, by any standard. So it really, you know, if it, maybe we go down to Caroline's 10, but if we don't, I mean, we still have a process where um, there's still quite um, lengthy um, terms. I thought that one of the big concerns would be how do you assure that confirmation happens? Um, and, the, and maybe this allows you to segue a little bit, uh, Trevor. Um, but the, I think reforms around the confirmation process are really crucial. Um, and then with term limits and Rick referred to this a little bit, you would have to design some sort of kind of speedy confirmation act to ensure that we don't sort of take that sort of tit for tat and leave things open for a long time. Um, I'll just end this part by just by saying, I will accept Biden's you know, nomination to the Supreme Court if there are term limits. Um, <laughs> um, but uh, I know there are other issues you wanted to, to get on. And that was a joke. <laughs> oh, not that's for the, me. That's the headline. I, the I headline. second it. <laughs> um, can that's I oh, go, ahead, go ahead, Rick. Well, can, can I respond to, to, to David a little bit? So um, uh, one thing I, I, I learned, or I guess all of us learned during the process is that term limits actually have a surprising amount of bipartisan support. Uh, it's not, I didn't mention that, um, but that was kind of eye-opening to me, uh, unlike some of these other uh, reform proposals. I mean, of course, that doesn't mean people universally accept the idea, not at all. David's expressed very, very elegantly some of the concerns. Um, but the National Constitution Center, for example, I uh, asked a group of pro progressive scholars and conservative libertarian scholars how they would redesign the constitution. Um, two of those groups at least agreed what the term limits would be the way to go. Um, and experienced Supreme Court practitioners who testified to the commission who were very uh, reluctant, actually opposed to nearly all of the reform proposals that were put on the table, said term limits was one of the two proposals worth taking seriously and, and considering. I have a hard time accepting David's concerns about the stability of the doctrine and the culture of the institution and the like, 
when for nearly all of our history, for most of our history up until 1970, the average justice served 15 years. And we're talking about an 18 year term. Um, and, you know, and I would ask David, you know, do you think Supreme Court doctrine has been more stable or less stable since we moved into the 1970s in this new era in which justices served for 26 years on average? So, so though that part of David's concerns, I, I just, uh, I think we sort of have an empirical test. Um, and, and I don't, uh, I, I have a hard time accepting that. I do think the issue about the confirmation process and more confirmations is a, is a serious issue. Uh, and so let me segue to answering um, the question you raised and, and, and the issue Aliti uh, brought up. Even apart from term limits, we have a serious problem now with the confirmation process in the sense that we now face a realistic risk that if we have divided government, one party controlling the Senate and the other party controlling the White House, um, that we may not get any justice confirmed. I mean, I think we all know that's a, that's a prospect we're facing. I don't know if it will happen, but it's certainly a realistic um, concern. And that's gonna be a problem for the confirmation process we have already. Um, now, it's also a problem for term limits because if part of the justification is each president should have an equal opportunity to nominate, if a Senate repeatedly blocked the president's nominees, it would undermine one of the justifications for term limits. Uh, and so one of the things the report did is, is try to work through that issue, as Aliti mentioned. Um, and there are various uh, smaller and larger steps you can take uh, to try to deal with that. And, and it's partly a question of whether you think term limits can be done legally by statute and whether they should be done by statute, even if it is constitutional to do that, or whether this would be done in the context of a constitutional amendment. Because if you do it by a constitutional amendment, then you also have a lot more freedom to think about how you might redesign the, the confirmation process to deal with the risk of, of repeated impasse. Uh, so one thing that was proposed to the commission is that uh, the Senate gets a, a certain amount of time to uh, uh, have a hearing on a nominee if the hearing isn't held within, let's say, three or four months, the person is deemed confirmed. Um, now, that's sort of weak because the Senate can go through the motions of holding a hearing and still vote people down repeatedly. Um, and you need a trigger when the Senate is acting um, beyond the advice and consent role that, that we think is appropriate. So the fact that the Senate rejects one nominee shouldn't be a, an enormous concern, but what you're worried about is repeated rejections for a seat. Um, and uh, we talked about, and the report considers some new options for how you might deal with that. Um, there are some options that would give the president the power to make an appointment after two rejected nominations. I'm not in favor of that idea. I think it gives the president too much power. Um, you could design it so that the number of votes needed for confirmation decreases uh, after you get one or two rejections. Uh, or you could desi design a structure that bypasses the standard Senate and presidential confirmation process uh, after repeated rejections. Uh, so for example, one of the things the report talks about, which is clearly a novel idea, um, is after repeated rejections, uh, the president nominates a justice, uh, and maybe um, it has to be approved by, let's say, uh, the Court of Appeals chief judges, or some subset of them that are drawn randomly, uh, like five or seven Court of Appeals chief judges. Now, that's, you know, obviously out of the box, uh, because, and it requires a constitutional amendment. But, but those are the directions that the report uh, kind of explores to deal with the, the risk of repeated impasse. But I do want to emphasize that's a risk we're going to face under the current system if we don't change anything in any event. Um, and it's also a risk a term limits proposal would have to address. Thanks. That's, this is a super important point to highlight. And I, I'm not sure it's well understood by you know, the, the interested public which is if the goal is a regularization of the timing and interval of, of vacancies um, and therefore appointments to the court, um, then as difficult as term limits might be to achieve, 
legislatively or to, to generate the supermajorities to support a constitutional amendment, it will also be insufficient unless something is done to ensure that at those intervals, justices are actually seated into those vacancies. Um, and it may be, I don't know, that what you took to be weak, Rick, you know, there's an argument that um, if all that is done is obliging the Senate to, you know, a committee to hold a hearing and to vote up or down, and say failure to vote up or down within a certain period of time then automatically seats the nominee. You might say that's weak in the sense that a Senate could repeatedly vote down, but one might also say at that point, if a Senate is prepared not just to effectively pocket veto nominees, but repeatedly to muster the votes to vote down nominees seriatim over time, there might not be a lot that could be done to save that system from a, from a broader implosion, which is to say there's a variety of stronger and weaker ways to deal with that issue. But I think the underlying point here is very strong argument to be made that any one of them would require a constitutional amendment, which really pushes you into the space of, of amendment, not for sure, but very, very likely for taking care of this part of the problem. Bob, I see you leaning forward, which suggests to me you want to you want in on this, please. Yeah, very briefly. I just wanted to say before, because I know we might even want to touch on judicial ethics before we yeah. finish in a few other areas. But the one thing, since we're on the confirmation process, I want to plug the appendix uh, that I think has been referred to by another speaker. I think the commission received outstanding testimony that had been developed at some considerable length and effort up from bipartisan sources of expertise and experience in the Senate confirmation process that lay out uh, a way of thinking about what the process should be, how the Senate should govern itself. It's contained in the appendix. It addresses questions like the timeliness of the Senate's actions, the way, uh, the requirement that uh, nominees re receive an up or down vote, uh, the independence of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, bipartisanship in certain aspects of the process. And frankly, reading it over, I think everybody can agree, it's very sound. And you would think that it's something that uh, could receive bipartisan support within the Senate. It becomes even more significant now that we have a confirmation process looming. And uh, so I think the commission, and, and in particular, uh, those who participated in presenting this testimony to the commission, did an enormous public service. And I'd like to have it out there and uh, thought about, considered, and brought into the conversation about what we should expect now as we anticipate a confirmation process for the successor to Justice Breyer's seat completely agree with you on that. I, and I know um, we actually have some members of the press in the audience today. So in case you haven't yet looked at it, it's Appendix C in the report. It starts on page 254. Um, and I think we all commend it to you as the result of some really serious work um, and careful thinking that, that uh, we all on the commission appreciated. We've got five minutes left. Let's take up the issue of judicial ethics. I, I mean, I think something that surprises even many lawyers, but certainly non-lawyers across the country, is that every federal judge in our system is legally subject to a set of ethical rules, except nine of them. Uh, and it's the nine who sit atop the federal judiciary. What to make of that and what to do about that? Um, Alati, do you want to start? And then we should ask the former federal judge among us what he thinks about the state of affairs too. Yeah, I mean, I'll speak at a very broad level since we don't have that much time. And uh, and David, judge, uh, maybe you can weigh in on uh, some of the specifics or what you think is most necessary. So, I mean, so one, you've already referred to the idea that um, the judicial conference um, devises rules of judicial conduct, which is directed to all federal judges, except for the Supreme Court, right? And so um, the Supreme Court says, the justices sometimes say they follow the code, but there's some debate whether, as to whether that's true or consistent over time. I don't mean just to single out this judge, this, this court. Um, but in any event, the point of the code is, is its visibility, it's its transparency, it's to so that we understand what that code is. So the the judicial conference, the Supreme Court could write itself a code, Congress could also write one. Um, and there's some debate over who should do it. Another area of um, discussion in the report are around um, recusal rules. Um, so the court doesn't consistently state its reasons for, um, or just individual justices for recusal. Um, so maybe there could be um, tighter rules requiring a statement or they could adopt it as a practice. There could also be tighter rules from Congress on financial recusal um, and those would be visible to all of us. Um, I just wanna mention um, a couple of other things really briefly. I mean, one just seems to me just the lowest hanging fruit, which 
is the idea of streaming um, oral arguments. I mean, this is a really big deal for the public. Um, and the court has resisted it, but did it during the pandemic. And like a lot of the disruptions of the pandemic, you think, well, isn't this something we can institutionalize? I think another that um, is very much in the media and debate right now is around um, the, the the use of emergency orders to make you know sort of significant or monumental um, opinions and sometimes changes of the law, what sometimes people call the shadow docket. There was some discussion that after the report, the Supreme Court was actually using the shadow docket less, but I don't think that that's necessarily true. We just saw, um, or we don't know yet if it's true. We just saw a very highly visible restricting opinion that some argue what was not a proper use of the um, shadow docket, including um, you know triggering a dissent on that. So, David, I don't know if you want to come in on some of the specifics of things you might think of as viable. Well, you did a great job, really, of summarizing uh, you know what the what the report addresses. I I think. Uh, Again, it's, I, I come from this as we don't want Supreme Court exceptionalism. These are, these are judges and they should be uh, subject to the, generally to the same rules as all uh, Article III judges. So um, it makes sense for there to be a code of conduct, I think, for the Supreme Court. I don't think that's, it's really not difficult, particularly when you consider that the code of conduct that applies to federal judges is just advisory. But I think most institutions, businesses, universities, um, nonprofits, courts have discovered that having an aspirational code is valuable. You do training around it. You have compliance uh, procedures, then it can it can make a difference. It heightens attention to, uh, you know, what what uh, corporate America calls an ethical culture, and and that's uh, you know that's that would be that would be helpful to the court. I, I think the problems um, around recusal are they're more severe for the court, and so that is somewhat exceptional. You know, for a, a lower court judge, if you recuse, it's not a big deal, and and and, and frankly, you're inclined to do it if if the party raises an issue and you say, "Gee, I don't know," uh, but maybe I maybe they're right, and there's it's not a big deal another judge will come in to handle the case you've got plenty of work to do and um you know life goes on but on the supreme court if a if a justice recuses it's uh, it can be uh it, it will affect the outcome in 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 many cases it may it may be critical so and there's nobody else waiting in the wings who can come in so that's that drives uh, sort of a set of concerns and then finally um you know the court is right to be sensitive about having any kind of external um, ethics uh, sort of uh, police officer or inspector general, that sort of thing, which could end up being a way in which the other branches try to uh, affect the court or uh, diminish the court or discipline the court or punish the court for decisions that, that they don't like. That I think that poses a, a, a wholly different kind of risk uh, than we're dealing with with the, with the regular system that applies to all judges. I'll end there. Thank you. Um, well, if we were gathering as we usually do for these four in uh, Greenberg Lounge, I'd be inviting the audience to uh, thank all of our panelists and you'd hear rousing applause, standing ovation the whole bit, I'm sure. As it is, let me say thank you uh, to our panelists um, for really digging into this important set of issues in this debate as, um, as I think we all agree and Bob said very powerfully earlier, um, the goal of the commission in many ways was to um, provide that group's best collective thinking on a set of issues that deserve to be thought about deeply and consistently over time. Um, and everyone's participation in this event today is testament to that as well. So thank you to our panelists. And thank you to our audience for joining us and I wish you a good afternoon.